Today, the, pla the planets surely are in line. In 1979, when Lemuel C. Summers gave a gift to the college that he wanted to see benefit both college and church, uh, the chairman of the religion department was Dr. Lee A. Trife. Dr. Rife and Lemuel Summers sat down and worked out and developed the basic form in which the lectures should be should take place and what we are experiencing today is that, that form. Another gift established the Lewis the Rife Lewis Fund to provide at that time scholarships for clergy uh, seeking continuing education credit through the program. This was a gift made by Mrs. Jerry uh, L. Wright, who at that time was the archivist for the library. Today, the son's lecturer is Joseph T. Wright, the son of the two Wrights whose names are so closely linked with the lectureship, so that's planetary. <laughs> for 30 years, I had the privilege uh, and the honor of teaching with Lee Wright, and in what remains for me, one of the most memorable years, uh, we took what ordinarily would have been six sections of the Bible course and combined them into one lecture section of about 150 students. We would lecture uh, twice a week and then we would meet those uh, in groups of 12 uh, sections uh, for the third credit hour. Uh, we would take turns lecturing, and that was great fun. Uh, we would soon heard, however, that the students were referring to us with the uh, nom de gar of uh, the popular music team, the Righteous Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> During those, during those years, our two families uh, shared child rearing, public education, uh, crises in church, college, the community. Uh, so it is with something akin to familiar pride that I have the honor and privilege of introducing Till Wright today. And also welcoming the Reverend Betty Cartwright, uh, a Millsaps alum. Uh, a religion major and spouse of our <coughs> lecturer. Professor Reif is a 1976 graduate of Millsaps and a magna cum uh, laude masters of divinity graduate from Emory University. He was ordained elder in the United Methodist Church in 1981 and served pastoral appointments in the Mississippi Annual Conference, where he is still a member, uh, from 1980 to 1985. Those years provided him with an experiential as well as a theoretical understanding of the dynamics that may exist between congregation, pastor, elders of the Annual Conference, and the social context in which it all exists. In 1985, he returned to Emory and began doctoral studies with emphasis in theology and personality. In 1990, he joined the faculty of Emory and Henry College at Ellington, Virginia, where he is currently chairperson of uh, the religion department. He has served the college in various capacities as one is wont to do as a member of the faculty of the Liberal Arts College. <laughs> Uh, he served one year as the interim dean for academic affairs and again as the chair of the humanities division. A glance at the courses he teaches at Emory and Henry suggests the range of his research, his areas of competence and interest. These include the Bible surveys, uh, personality and faith development, ethics, Wesleyan theology, educational ministry of the church, and one with the title, Boss Baseball, More Than a Game. <laughs> I, I remember him as an avid little leader. <laughs> he has been honored both by his college and by the general board of higher education 
ministry of the United Methodist Church for its excellence in teaching and his former students who are teaching in colleges elsewhere remarked that it was his teacher that led them to choose that vocation. In addition to the book that has been published, which we celebrate today, his research has yielded over 40 articles, presentations at professional meetings, uh, chapters in books, and reviews of other works. He has written on faith development, education of children and youth in the church, which continues uh, a focus of his uh, doctoral thesis. The focus of his research in excuse me, in, in the area, uh, presently, is in the area of ethics and congregational life. He asks, what is a just society? Uh, there is a piece on Aristophanes, Lysistrata, uh, women in the early church, baby boomers in a mainline congregation, and models of congregational repentance. Among the articles and presentations on Born of Conviction, he participated in a talk back at the Irondale Theater in Brooklyn, New York, following the performance of a play with the title Born of Conviction. The playwright was a daughter of a minister who signed the, uh, the controversial document, and her play deals with the consequences of a father's action on the family and its continuing impact on her life. In the talk he speaks, in the talk back, he speaks to the relevance of knowing history, citing William Faulkner, the past is not dead, it is not even past. The, pa the past, the book recounts, is one when a racist ethos determined what could and could not be spoken in the pulpit of a Methodist pulpit in Mississippi. It was a past when 28 pastors were told that their witness to their conviction was unacceptable. Race was only one factor in the dynamic of the annual conference that rejected the opportunity at that time to open a dialogue. That could have been a dialogue about who are welcome when the faithful gather to hear scripture read, the word proclaimed, and the sacrament received. Today, the past that is not past is the opportunity for dialogue on the question who may read the scripture, who may preach the word, and who may administer the sacrament. Joe, I see you name friends who may have asked at one time, when are you gonna finish that book? <laughs> <laughs> Let me say that it has been worth the wait for your insight, for the care, the wisdom, the thoroughness of your work, and the timeliness of its publication. So for your labor of love, we thank you. And for coming to speak to us about stories nobody knows, Mississippi Methodist race relation in the 60s. Please join me in welcoming. Our son Joseph is here with Betty. And he has not, he is tw almost 28 years old. He has not been to Jackson since he was five. So it's high time that he came back. <laughs> I count this invitation to deliver the 2016 Summers Lecture as one of the singular honors of my life. The obvious explanation for this stems from my dad's involvement as department chair in the lectureship's beginnings, and what better way to symbolize that than to have than to be introduced by his colleague and closest friend, T.W. Lewis. Both men have been crucial to my formation as teacher, scholar, and human being. But another reason why this is such an honor is that the second annual lecture in this series in 1980 was delivered by one of my most important academic mentors, James W. Fowler. Dr. Fowler directed my dissertation at Emory University, had a huge influence on my intellectual <coughs> development and on my life. My dad died in September 2014. Jim Fowler died in October of 2015. 
I have often referred to Millsaps College as my parent institution. And so my presence here today feels like a completion of the circle of life. <clears throat> I'm here today to tell you some important stories that symbolize to me something essential about the most important theological and ethical conundrum of my scholarly career. The relationship of the Christian church to the world, the culture in which it must live. That was also central, I might add, to my dad's life as professor and minister and follower of Jesus. What role should the Christian church as religious institution and Christian people as individual disciples play in society, especially in response to the long history and present ongoing reality of injustice and human suffering related to race? Some of the stories are, that I'm going to tell are fairly well known, but some have languished in relative secrecy until the recent publication of my book. The vehicle for my discussion today is some of the stories surrounding the Born of Conviction statement uh, the Born of Conviction controversy in Mississippi in early 1963. It's a Mississippi story and a Methodist story, and those two are wrapped up together. That's the source of the subtitle, White Methodists and Mississippi's Closed Society. And when I consider who I am as a person, those two M words are tightly wrapped up in my soul. I was only a child and had nothing to do with the Born of Conviction statement, but the Born of Conviction story is my story and has been, has been ever since I first heard about Born of Conviction in the Millsaps College cafeteria a few yards away from us from Sid Connor, son of signer James Connor, and Jim Athena, grandson of conference lay leader J.P. Stafford, who supported the signers publicly. In the photo on the left, the cover image, you see, everybody knows who that is, uh, James Meredith, a 29-year-old Air Force veteran from Kosciuszko, who sought successfully to integrate Ole Miss in 1962. He's accompanied by Chief U.S. Marshal James McShane and U.S. Justice Department Attorney John Doerr. In this September 26, 1962 scene, <coughs> Lieutenant Governor Paul B. Johnson is preventing Meredith from registering. On the screen to the right, you see the image of the Born of Conviction statement, which responded to the Ole Miss riot. In order to tell you about Born of Conviction, I need first to say a few things about what was happening across the South in the 1950s and 1960s, but especially in Mississippi. This is the best known story that I'm going to tell you today, and the backdrop really for all the other stories. There are many in this room who lived in Mississippi during this time. Others of you have read about it. These two books, one by John Dittmer, a white scholar who taught at Tugela College for many years, and Charles Payne, an African-American scholar, um, both of them published in the mid-1990s tell that story very well. And I just need to begin by saying that when we think of those years, the real heroes in Mississippi 
are people like Medgar Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer, Aaron Henry, Ed King, and John Salter, Bob Moses, Victoria Gray, um, and other people. Um, James Cheney, um, Andy Goodman, Michael Schwerner, etc. And if you consider yourself a Mississippian and care about the state's story, past, present, and future, I would encourage you to read these books if you have not already. I would also add that I don't tell this story in the book because of what my book focuses on, but when I think about the African American Methodist Church and the Mississippi Conference, the southern half of the state, the names that come to my mind, people that I knew, are people like Wendell Taylor, Charlemagne Payne, Henry C. Clay, Jr., L.P. Ponder, Clary Collins Harvey, um, Alan Johnson, Clint Collier, and many, many other folks. But what I looked at in my book was what was going on in the world of white Mississippians in this time. How did they respond? And the word, of course, that uh, the term that's often used is massive resistance. Frank Smith, who was a Mississippi congressman for about a decade from the Delta, uh, said in 1964, the entire structure of political, economic, religious, and social life in Mississippi has for 10 years been devoted to the creation of immutable resistance to integration. So, what Professor James Wesley Silver at Ole Miss said about this was he called it the closed society. I interviewed a lot of people from my book, and one of them, Shirley Ship Holston, the widow of Wilton Holston, who was the brother of James Holston, one of the signers of the Warren Conviction Statement. And I thought the way she summed it up says a lot. In those days, talking about the 50s and 60s, you had to travel in a narrow little lane, and if you stepped one foot over the line, you were in trouble. So there was, mass, there was a massive resistance climate, and it was overwhelming for white folks as well as African Americans. <coughs> it was exceedingly difficult, of course, for blacks, much more so. But, I, but Fannie Lou Hamer, who to me is one of the most important <coughs> leaders in the civil rights movement in the United States, sharecropper from Sunflower County, also talked about the toll on whites. In 1966, she said, our prayers and all we had lived for started to be translated into action. Now we have action and we're doing something that will not only free the black man in Mississippi, but will hopefully free the white man as well. That time did spiritual damage to white and black alike. And one of the responses I've had to my book from several people is how painful it is to read that story. In fact, my mother, who asked to be uh, from me to greet all of you who know her, would have loved to have been here. But when she heard me speak at Emory Henry College back in November, she told several folks that was hard to listen to difficult to remember those years. But focusing in even more, how did white Methodists, especially those in the Mississippi Conference, we had a North Mississippi Conference and a Mississippi Conference, southern half of the state. We also had two black conferences, the Central Jurisdiction, the Upper Mississippi Conference and the Mississippi Conference. So how did white Methodists, especially in the Mississippi Conference, respond to what was happening here in the 1950s and 1960s? John C. Satterfield was an attorney from Yazoo City. He lived in Jackson some as well. 
Um, and what he says here reflects the fact that officially the white Methodist church in Mississippi was complicit with and acquiesced to the closed society, the, th the way things were in Mississippi. And you see the quote. This is uh, something he said in 1960 in response to the church property bill controversy. Our bishop, our ministers, and our laymen stand <coughs> solidly for the southern way of life. Methodists elsewhere just need to realize that the maintenance of the integrity of the two great races in our churches, our schools, and our homes is consistent with the principles of Jesus Christ. <coughs> In this segregated, white, supremacist culture, many white Christians had what James Fowler would call a conventional faith. It was tacit, it was unexamined, and they saw no difference between their Christian faith and the Southern way of life, the way things had always been. We can call this this statement up here, what I've just said, the Satterfield assumption about church and segregation. But let's complicate that story. What Satterfield ignored was that the seeds of eventual dissent were sown, took root, and were growing in the white Methodist church in Mississippi. There's no better proof of the problem with Satterfield's assumption than Vicksburg native Ed King, who grew up in Crawford Street Methodist Church and went to school here at Millsaps from 1954 to 1958, and went off to Boston University School of Theology and got involved in the Civil Rights Movement. He returned to Mississippi in late January 1963, just after Born of Conviction had come out to become chaplain at Tougaloo College, and he became a leader in the Jackson movement. As Charles Marsh said, and by the way, this is another book you need to read if you haven't read it, Charles Marsh's God's Long Summer. Ed King's broadening social vision had profound religious sources. Ironic though it may seem, the white segregated Methodist church in Mississippi prepared him for a new perception of race and social order. Ed knew several of the eventual signers of Born of Conviction at Millsaps, and his signer John Ed Thomas reminded us here in this room 10 years ago. Ed's witness, along with many other local people in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement, far outshined what the Born of Conviction signers did. But it's important to note in this Mississippi and Methodist story that although the vast majority of white Mississippi Methodists shared Satterfield's assumption and agreed with him, nonetheless, the formative experiences of the eventual 28 signers led them to think and speak for themselves and offer an alternative to maintenance of racial integrity in Mississippi. So let's look at that briefly in the lives of four eventual signers. James Nicholson's father was a preacher in the conference, T.E. Nicholson. When he was in high school at Kapiah Lincoln <coughs> College in 1941, he heard Methodist layman and educator R. Lanier Hunt. Uh, Mr. Hunt's brother, Bruner Hunt, was a uh, pastor in this conference for many years. He heard Lanier Hunt speak, and Mr. Hunt asked the students, to imagine what life would be like for them if they were to use the polite term then, Negroes. What would they not be able to do that they took for granted as whites? That opened up a world of thought for James Nicholson. And Powell Hall, as a teenage member of Capitol Street Methodist Church in Jackson in the late 1940s, read a book by E. Stanley Jones, which focused on Acts 10, 34-35, where Peter says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. And he suddenly understood that Mississippi's system of segregation and white supremacy was unchristian. Jerry Trigg, another of the signers, learned by observing the way his mother 
a caseworker and eventually the director of the Clark County Mississippi Welfare Department. The way she treated all people, white and black, with, with the same respect. And Jim Waits, as a high school junior in 1953 at Main Street Methodist Church in Hattiesburg, attended a youth service at St. Paul Methodist Church, an African-American central jurisdiction church, with some other teens from his church. He was encouraged to do that, by the way, by Eugene Dias, who was the associate pastor at the church at the time. When the black preacher that night did an altar call, and offered a special invitation to anyone who felt called to the ordained ministry, or as we used to say, full-time Christian service. <laughs> Waits responded. The next day, back at his white Main Street church, the news got around fast, and some people were upset that he had done this at a black church. When complaints continued at an official board meeting, the pastor, John W. Moore, Moore said, Now, brethren, it seems to me that if that had happened in hell, it would have been good news. <laughs> Jim Waits has often said that he was influenced by his pastors and Sunday school teachers and that he believed what they taught him. It was as simple as that. Other influences in the lives of signers Millsaps College, Jerry, Jerry Trigg, Jim Waits, 16 born of conviction signers in all graduated from this school. A couple of others attended here. They were influenced by professors like Marguerite Goodman, Bond Fleming, Robert Bergmark, George Maddox, who helped them to see beyond the fog of their segregated society to the possibility of a different world. Some Millsap students, including future signer Rod Entrican, who is here today, uh, participated in the inter Intercollegiate Council and met with students from black colleges in Mississippi. The other the person in the photo here is Sam Bearfield, who was the director of the Wesley Foundation at Mississippi Southern College for seven years in the 1950s. Ten of the signers attended Southern. Many of them counted Sam Bearfield as an important mentor. And part of what he did was uh, do programming and take students on trips to conferences where the students also caught glimpses of that different world. This process of awakening continued for most of the future signers in their seminary education. Back to massive resistance for a moment. In 1962, about two and a half weeks before the riot at Ole Miss, Governor Ross Barnett said, Mississippi will not surrender to the evil and illegal forces of tyranny, and no school will be ingrained in Mississippi while I am your governor. Now, I think it's important to point out that it was not illegal. The courts ruled again and again, and that's part of the rule of law in our country, at least the last time I checked. And the evil was in the segregated system in Mississippi. And also, what Barnett said was an empty promise. And I think he knew that even then when he said it. But it was what the majority of whites wanted to hear, or at least what he thought. So that's the first story. The second story I'm going to tell is less well known, although if you've read my book, you, you know it now, about the Born of Conviction Statement. I have sometimes said that the Born of Conviction Statement is the second best known white clergy statement of the Civil Rights era, the first being the statement that Martin Luther King responded to in his letter from Birmingham Jail that was signed uh, by, among other people, Bishop Norman Harmon, a Millsaps graduate, and uh, many of us knew Bishop Harmon in our Candler years. Um, the response to the riot in Oxford 
in September, drew some statements from some North Mississippi ministers. There was a call for repentance by some Oxford ministers. The North Mississippi Conference cabinet endorsed that in the advocate. But there was silence from Mississippi Conference leaders. I don't think I have to tell anybody in the room what that photo is. It's the Lyceum Building on the afternoon of September 30th, 1962, with the marshals gathered and the crowd gathering, and you know what happened. But what you see on the right is the top of the Born of Conviction statement. And just notice some of the language. It was written in mid-October, about two weeks after the Ole Miss riot. It wasn't published till January 2nd. Um, and but mentions things like grave crises precipitated by racial discord within our state in recent months. The genuine dilemma facing persons of Christian conscience. As Christian ministers and native Mississippians, we have a particular obligation to speak, to respond to the idolatry of the closed society. And again, the, conference, the Mississippi conference leaders had said nothing in response. So, born of the deep conviction of our souls as to what is morally right. I think they were saying, we know this goes against the grain of our culture, but we must say it anyway. And the foundations for what we say are found in the expressed witness of our church. The statement included four affirmations, and on the right, by the way, there is Edmund Moore, one of the signers uh, in the pulpit at Leggett Memorial Church, uh, which was destroyed, uh, unfortunately, by Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the church, not just the pulpit. Um, and Edmund preached a powerful sermon in 1960 in that pulpit in response to the um, beating of a group of blacks who were integrating the whites only Biloxi Beach. They were beaten by a mob of whites. Inman preached that, that sort of got Inman to quit talking just about brotherhood and to say something more. The statement called for freedom of the pulpit. The church belongs to God, not to the dominant closed society culture. Ministers should be free to preach their conscience, to say what they believe God would have them say in the current situation. They mention the expressed witness of the church. They quote from Galatians 3. They quote from the Methodist discipline um, in that second affirmation um, that the teachings of Jesus don't allow for discrimination on the basis of race. Fairly simple. They express support for the public schools um, and opposition to any attempt to close them when they were forced to desegregate or to use that state money for private and white only schools. And they said, we're not communists. Uh, recognizing that that label was used for, to describe anyone who dared to go against the status quo in the closed society. So the statement was released uh, between mid-October and the end of December. A total of 28 pastors signed it. Their names are here um, in the slide in this document. Uh, and as I said, they were members of the Mississippi Conference, the southern half of the state. The first four names in the first column are the four who wrote it. Jerry Furr, Max Dunham, Jim Waits, and Jerry Trigg. It was published in the conference newspaper on January 2nd, 1963. I think it's significant that January 2nd, 1963 is right in the midst of the most intense period of resistance in Mississippi to what was going on in the Civil Rights Movement. From 1962 to the end of Freedom Summer in 1964. It doesn't mean everything got all great after that, but that was, that was the period of highest resistance. And by the way, I want to say that when you look at the statement, it doesn't look that radical to us now, but when you know the context in which it was published, it was radical then. 
And I think what signer Rod Intrican said in 2004 about it fits pretty well. He described the publication of Born Conviction in January of 63 as like a bomb exploding in the state and in the conference. Every Mississippi daily newspaper reported on it the next day, most on the front page. Uh, these 28 ministers believed it was their task and calling as Christian ministers to say something against the madness of white Mississippi's racial injustice and mass hysteria. There was some public support for the statement. This is Sam Ashmore, the editor of the Mississippi Methodist Advocate. That note at the top in bold uh, type is his editorial comment. He also wrote a, an, an editorial and published it on the next page on freedom of the pulpit. J.P. Stafford, the conference lay leader, and Mark and Jim Matheny's grandfather, uh, also supported the signers and among other things said, this is an adjustment that Christians can make. W.B. Selah, the pastor at Galloway, supported the signers and really issued a stronger statement. He said, among other things, we should voluntarily desegregate all public facilities now. One of the things that uh, you can say about the Born Conviction story is that it's a generational struggle. Uh, but there's some problems with that. These three people that uh, whose picture I just, I just showed you were all born in the 1890s. It doesn't sound like just young against old to me. <laughs> and uh, Harold Riker, who was the oldest signer of Born and Conviction, was born in 1906 and was 56 years old when it came out. My dad remembered, I never knew Brother Riker, but my dad remembered Harold Riker uh, sort of complaining, joking, but complaining in the late 60s and early 70s. They always talk about those young ministers who signed that statement. <laughs> but Harold was 56 years old when he signed. <laughs> so there was a little bit of some public, public support, but the response to Born of Conviction was overwhelmingly negative. A lot of church members around the conference shared that Satterfield assumption. Being a white Mississippi Methodist to them meant you supported segregation. And now these ministers were not only saying otherwise, but they had dared to say it publicly. So within a couple of weeks, three of the signers were expelled from their churches immediately. James Rush in the Shoba County, uh, future Sheriff Lawrence Rainey of Neshoba County uh, was a member of uh, one of his congregations. Bill Lampton, pastor at uh, Pisgah in Pike County, left there on January 5th with his family and did not return. And James Nicholson in the Byron Church was also expelled from his church. And by the way, that, uh, that document there is from the first of three New York Times stories about Born Conviction. This one ran on January 19th, 1963. And several other signers got stiff resistance from their churches. There was a vote taken a few days after the statement was released to remove, uh, well, intent to remove Ed McRae, who is also here today, <coughs> um, he and his wife, Martina, um, <coughs> to remove him as pastor of Oakland Heights Methodist Church in Meridian. Um, but that failed. But one of those who voted to remove him was quoted in the paper, and I'm not going to read that, but I, I trust all of you. you know, it's basically saying that uh, what these signers said is, is, not, is not what the Methodist faith is about. Um, we're, we're being forced to listen to a minister who has shown by his actions that he does not care about our Southern way of life, but will betray part of his membership by signing what we believe is a politically inspired document. And by the way, I think that's one of the underlying issues in this story is that for a lot of Methodists, a lot of white Methodists in Mississippi Conference, 
Siders of born conviction betrayed the family. And that, that's basically uh, the way they felt about it. <clears throat> uh, but there were other ways that congregations um, expressed their displeasure. There was a lot of ostracism to me. One of the saddest stories is Joe and Ruth Way getting home from their church one Sunday a couple of weeks after the statement came out and their three-year-old daughter Wanda saying, nobody loves us anymore. Children of preachers can, can pick up what's going on in a congregation, and she did at the age of three. There were other churches whose pastors did not sign the statement, who issued resolutions rejecting um, rejecting born of conviction. We strongly urge the administrators of our church-related schools and theological seminaries to, because there was, the, that's where the problem was, by the way, <laughs> Nelson <laughs> College and uh, Campbell School of Theology, to, say, to take such steps as are necessary to see that the instructional personnel of their institutions shall not violate the time-honored practice of the separation of the races. There were other preachers in the conference who rejected born conviction. This letter to Sam Ashmore saying in part, I also believe that God is the father of all mankind, but that he created every race and color and intended for man to stay that way. I believe in justice for all, but I also believe in race purity. This is a letter from a lay person who lived in Jackson to Sam Ashmore. Sam Ashmore, the editor of the advocate, got a lot of letters, and if you want to read them, they're in the conference archives, by the way. Um, got a lot of letters. But this one, I think, reflects something pretty important. All my life, I've considered the Methodist Church my church, and I love my church. But the action of some of our ministers who apparently are trying to consolidate our church with politics are taking my church away from me. A lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, criticism of born conviction related to how the statement hurt the church, was hurting the institutional church. But it seems to me, if you read between the lines here, that part of what he's saying is the purpose of the church is to support me in my uncritical acceptance of the dominant culture's unjust system of segregation. Too political. What does that really mean when someone accuses someone else of being too political? That the political system as it stands is being challenged and you shouldn't do that. In other words, this man's objection is a political objection. That's one of the ironies of people always saying, you're getting political. That's a political statement, too. <laughs> if you want things to stay the way they are, that's a political choice, a political statement. And my church, but it's God's church, which Born Conviction said, as I will remind you, he's saying, when I'm, ha when I'm happy with the way things are, then the church is not supposed to challenge the way things are. You might ask, how did the conference respond to the conference leaders who had not said anything? This is a picture of Bishop Marvin Franklin, uh, who was bishop in Mississippi for 16 years, well loved uh, for good reasons, uh, I might add. But two weeks after Board of Conviction came out, the conference uh, the bishop and the cabinet issued a statement. They said nothing directly about the conviction. Uh, and reading between the lines, I, you know, I, I think they were basically saying, uh, there's no need to get worked up about this issue. Uh, for instance, um, saying that uh, the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution of Methodist Church places racial relationships on a voluntary basis by the provisions of this amendment. Integration is not forced on any part of our church. That was correct, but I think they're basically saying, you know, don't worry, this, this, is, this is not anything very important. However, so let's forge ahead with the mission of the church we don't want to hurt the church. Things are going great for the church. Let's don't mess it up.
another letter which also talked about how the church should stick to winning souls for Christ and leave politics alone. But Elton Brown, who's also here today, said in a letter to James Silver, he responded to that view by telling his church members in Natchez that the church should also confront the world's problems because the idea that the soul is somehow separate from the physical and social realities of the world or that those physical and social realities <coughs> don't have a spiritual component is just false. But there's another story and that story relates to the anguish that was felt by many Methodist church members in the Mississippi Conference. Those who felt this moral dilemma in their bones, but had not found the courage to speak. There was lots of negative response. The, the signers got lots of negative response, but they also got a lot of positive response mostly under the surface and behind the scenes. So here's someone saying, thank you for saying it. I don't have the courage to say it, but, uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's, that's the wrong, that's the wrong slide. <coughs> um, uh, here we go. That's the slide I want. That, that was a, that was a, uh, a letter that uh, Wilton Carter, signer Wilton Carter got from a member of his church praising him for uh, signing it. Here's the one that I was talking about. A member of Maxie Dunham's church in Gulfport saying, I'm ashamed of my own silence. My husband and I have tried not to rock the boat since we chose to live here. So I can't tell you what it means to know that you and others like you are saying what I feel, but do not have the courage to say. The words from the Board of Conviction Statement, Indeed, as Christian ministers and as native Mississippians, sharing the anguish of all our people, we have a particular obligation to speak. These were pastors. They knew what was going on in the hearts and minds of their church members. Even some of their church members who said something else, uh, who supported the way things were. But there was some public support in congregations. Arno Vincent, a member of the Cater Methodist Church, spoke at a January 1963 official board meeting uh, where the church was considering Buford Dickinson's participation. And uh, he heard a lot of the discussion. Uh, Mr. Vincent, I think, was president of uh, East Central uh, junior college for a while. He said, you know, folks, if we want a minister to tell us what we want to hear, we don't need a minister. We can just tape record our own speeches and listen to them. <laughs> so, what did Born of Conviction accomplish? One of the images that I've used is that it helped create a crack in the facade of the united front, supposed united front, for the maintenance of segregation and against any attempt to dismantle it. Satterfield's assumption was, of course, that all white Mississippians want things to stay the way they are. But Born of Conviction cracked that facade, at least a little bit. It gave voice to the views of a significant minority in the church that people had not felt free to express. In some local churches and communities, it facilitated some conversations about race, gave people permission to talk about it. In Jack Troutman's church in Big Point, right in the southeast corner of the state of Mississippi, they were having a Bible study and discussing Galatians 3.28, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, all are one in Christ Jesus. Um, and talking about Paul's efforts to break down the barriers between Jew and Gentile and 
a segregationist member said, wondered aloud, if Paul's words might apply to the race issue in Mississippi and the nation. <coughs> Briefly, what became the 28, I talked about this at length in the book. I'm not going to belabor it now, but uh, 20 of the signers left, a couple of those, actually three of them came back. But here's the point that gets lost, and that is that eight of the signers never left Mississippi, and all of those continued as Methodist ministers in the state. Telling this story has felt a little bit like archaeology to me. And I hope you understand that metaphor, digging up stuff that's been buried for a long time. And it's touched a nerve. I've heard from some folks who've said, uh, retired ministers in the conference who've said, it was cathartic to, to read this. It was painful to read this. There were a few folks who refused to be interviewed because they didn't want to revisit those days. But if you ask the question, why does this story touch a nerve? I can't speak for everyone, but perhaps I can say a little about me and some Mississippians of my generation. So here's my explanation of the title of the lecture. Any Lucinda Williams fans in here? Um, her father, Miller Williams, by the way, taught biology at Millsap from 1955 to 1957. She was born in 1953, so she was a child on this campus. And, um, you know, that was, of course, before he became a poet and teacher of writing. He ended up at the uh, University of Arkansas with James Whitehead, another uh, former Millsap faculty member. <coughs> Low hum of voices in the front seat, stories nobody knows. Got folks in Jackson we're going to meet, car wheels on a gravel road. The song takes the perspective of a child who lives in the world of her parents and knows there's a lot going on there that she doesn't yet understand. The stories I've told today took place when I was a child. Ellen Ann Fentress, in a 2014 article in Atlantic, talking about the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, talks about the desire of our generation, she's about my age, to understand the people and culture to which we were hazy witnesses. Whether the adults spoke a word about the struggle or not, most especially if no words were uttered in the tense, dissolving assumptions of our childhood, we absorbed the atmosphere. Our community's parameters contoured our hearts and heads. I talk a little bit in the book about some of the families of signers that had older kids. Some families, they, some of the parents didn't talk about it, others did. Uh, those were some important differences. Back in the fall on Facebook, I put up a couple of pictures and a description of what happened on June 9, 1963 at Galloway Church when five blacks came to worship, were turned away, and before the day was over, W.B. Seeland and Jerry Furr had both resigned their pastorates at Galloway. Two people, both of whom were teenagers at the time and members of Galloway Church, put up these comments in response. One said, I was at Galloway that fateful Sunday, still shocked. And the other one said, I'll never forget it. Stories nobody knows doesn't just refer to how deeply buried we are, but also, what do they mean? Why did our elders respond in the ways that they did? Where did they find the courage if they were courageous? Or if they did wrong or were silent, how have they made peace with that? <laughs> My generation learned a lot about the world and how to live or how not to live as human beings and 
if we are Christian, as Christian disciples, as disciples of Jesus, from watching our parents and elders deal with the upheaval of those days and the intense resistance to it and the incredible changes that came as a result. I told this story 10 years ago in my lecture here, but I have not seen this picture when I told it. This is a picture taken uh, from across the street, uh, looking out a hotel room, motel room, by the photographer on a Sunday morning in October of 1963 at Capitol Street Church. Um, I told that story 10 years ago because I was sitting in our car with my mother and my brother and witnessed an integrated group come to the steps and be arrested simply for coming to church. And that seeing that has colored the way I've understood the relationship between the church and the world ever since. But I'm pretty sure that this is a picture of that day. And when it appeared in Carolyn DuPont's book, Mississippi Praying, a couple of years ago, first I saw the picture, and it was Capitol Street, and then I saw my dad in the top left corner of the picture. And he was the only person on the steps facing that group, and I should name the group, Betty Cool, Julie Zaug, and Ida Hanna, students at Tougaloo, two black, one white, Gerald Forshe and Donald Walden, Methodist ministers from Illinois. My dad was the only person on those steps facing the group that was sympathetic to what they were doing. He was there because Ed King had asked him to be there as a member of the church to observe and witness it. Now, in 1963, when I watched this, I was only nine years old. But I knew even then, at some level, that when I saw this, that something was wrong. The Christian faith centers on a story too. And anyone who thinks the story of Jesus includes keeping people out of the church because of the color of their skin needs to go back and read the story again. I'm sure that my Capitol Street Sunday School teachers had said something inside that building about how God and Jesus loved everyone. Jack Troutman, I mentioned him a minute ago, was at Big Point in Jackson County. His mother was Ross Barnett's cousin. You know, that's one of the things about the Mississippi stories. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mentioned George Maddox a minute ago. He was Roy Clark's brother-in-law. You know, I mean, you just can't not find connections among people. So, Jack said, you know, his mother uh, had written him because she didn't understand why he was doing this, why he had signed that statement. His brother thought he had betrayed his family. And Jack said in part to his mother, it is not for the Christian to conform to public opinion, but to let the love of God transform them into the personality of Jesus Christ, who looked upon all people as an infinite worth. Who are we to blame for such ra radical beliefs? Jesus Christ, who was the most radical and unpopular preacher that ever lived. His retelling of the story of Jesus is what German theolo political theologian Johann Baptist Metz, how'd you like to be named John the Baptist? Uh, <laughs> um, what Professor Metz would call a dangerous memory. A narrative that interrupts our lives and turns them upside down, revealing new hopeful and disruptive insights for our faith and action in the present and the future. The Board of Conviction story is an example of this. The signers allowed their lives to be interrupted by the power of a dangerous memory of the call of Jesus 
that most radical and unpopular preacher who wouldn't let them continue to accept the way things were in 1962 Mississippi. Who are we to blame, indeed, for any person who seeks to follow Jesus the way he or she relates to others, no matter who they are, is crucial to their integrity as Christian disciples. But that dangerous calling involves more than that because the interpersonal level doesn't go far enough. In a society which both in the 60s and now is characterized by systemic racism, the Christian faith calls its followers to stand against such insidious institutional evil. Why is it dangerous to remember stories from the civil rights era? Because if we pay attention to them, they will disturb our complacent lives, especially those of us who are white. Those memories call white people to be allies in the ongoing struggle for freedom and equality for African Americans and other people of color. What does it mean to be born of conviction today? <clears throat> Courageous leadership and action involve taking a stand for what is right, even though it's going to upset some people, even when it goes against a culture's idols. The willingness to lead and act with that kind of courage is what I would call being born of conviction. Uncovering such memories can be disturbing and yet offer hope for the future. Inspiration for us to see the ongoing, to see the ongoing systemic racial injustice in our society and find ways to work together Cross the racial divide to change it. The Christian church can help with that if it worries much less about preserving <coughs> itself and instead cultivates a community of people who are willing to follow that <coughs> radical, unpopular Jesus. Thank you.